In the 80s, Elon drove an, art, an Earth ambulance to the United Nations, stopping at nuclear sites across the country to rescue the Earth into pillowcases. In the 1990s, uh, her installation, The Liberation of God, was featured at the Jewish Arm & Hammer, Ackland, and Andy Warhol Museums. Ilan's work is included in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Jewish Museum of New York. She is the recipient of numerous awards and grants, and in 2016, she received the Women's Caucus of Art um, WCA Lifetime Achievement Award at a ceremony held in honor of her 85th birthday. And she will be presenting on her work and her uh, talk is titled Deconstructing God Through a Feminist Lens. I mean, I Thank you. Okay, I hope this works so far. I hope that all this technology will work. I'm not sure, but I'm going to tell you everything. I've got a lot of slides and I have some film clips. Okay, that's my book. Um, and I have a few extra copies here. If anybody wants any, I'll direct you with who to ask. Okay, let me see. Okay, my beginnings. Uh, the family. And... My mother is in the middle. You'll see more about her. I'll tell you more about her. This is my father's graduation picture. It hung in my bedroom because I shared my bedroom with my roommate who was my grandmother, Bava. So I always saw um, all the men and Something drove me to make a little pink line in between. <laughs> There's Baba. That, she is my roommate. All she did all day was daven, um, pray. In the morning, she would put her fingers into, I don't know if you ever heard about this, Nagelwasser, anybody? She would dip her fingers in into it in order to be able to say the prayer. Modane, um, thank you for restoring me. That's what I would hear every day of my life. Okay. Here I am. I'm the one with the white polished shoes, ready for Shulamit School for Girls in Borough Park. However, all, no matter how many years I studied, no matter how many yeshivas I went to, this is, a, this is called my notebooks, because never did I write a comment by a woman scholar for my notebooks. This was shown later on in the Aldrich Museum. <coughs> and you know, I just took the blank pages and I just furled them, because there was no use. There were no women comments for me, and I yearned for that. So it looks like a broken column, one on top of the other, although there are 54. To me, Olive Bait is spelled off to me. That's what it's spelled, meaning father. So, so I wrote on the blackboard. I wrote, I did not want to hear my fa the father's guidance and opinions so much. I wanted to hear the mothers. I wanted to know about their Yerat Shamayim. I wanted to know about their um, truths. 
that I could memorize so I could write them in my notebooks. And then here's, an, here's another piece from the God Project. It's, it's hard to see, but against the scriptures that are highlighted, there's a photograph sort of right behind there of my, this was my grandmother's. And I thought, um, I did not know what they knew. And I thought, if they knew what I was doing, what would they say? Would they have taken my cheek in their palm and said, Hindula, Miturnish, you mustn't. Or would they have said, Galaib to God, showing sight? Thanks be to God, it's about time. <laughs> Oh, oh, wait, okay. Oh, well, oh, oh that's good. The, this, this is, you know, I did this God Project, Nine Houses Without Women. So this is, the fourth one, it's epilogue, Alone with My Mother. Every, um, I would sit with my mother for Kol Nidre every year when it is said, who shall live and who shall die, who shall rise and who shall fall. And that's the pew. In back of the pew, I have the labels, Mrs. MRS, Etta, Bodoff, Greenfield, my mother's names, and then my phony name, Ms. Helene, MS, Helene, Ayla, uh, Greenfield. I put, I put them in, but I have, I had to explain to my mother what this is. She would say, belong, you'll be happier. What do you need this for? <laughs> but I knew I had to do this. Oh, wait. Am I doing this right, David? Yeah, OK. This was shown in the Israel, in Israel um, at the Matronita show. It's a 24-foot chart, a menstrual chart, of all the years of my marriage. And, uh, well, you see it. Then you'll see my marriage bed. Yes, in front of it. Projected onto the bed are um, the months that were clearly designated. And I just wanted to say that um, it's not a bad thing at all. Um, it's not a bad thing, and not only that, but I don't think, know if people know that the Torah said only men should bathe if he touches her impurity. A very vile way of, uh, it just shows the misogyny, even in the way it's worded. So it's my opinion that women decided to do that because nowhere does it say that women should do, should bathe, only that men should bathe. I, I sort of am a detective finding out these things, looking. Well, this is the liberation of God at last, and I'm going to read to you. I
I begin the liberation of God searching in the five books of Moses for the sections where God has been spoken for, I looked I look into the passages where patriarchal attitudes have been projected onto God, as though man has the right to have dominion even over God. I glue transparent parchment onto each page so that the parchment buckles, making the words cloud up and then clear while the viewer is inclined to press the page down to read the words as the sound of the parchment crackles. It felt, it sounded like the fireplace or something. I highlight onto the parchment that covers each page between words in the empty space where a female presence has been omitted. Just a line, vertical line. Where only the father's name is recorded as the parent who begot the offspring. And I highlight unto I highlight over words of vengeance, deception, cruelty, and misogyny, words attributed to God. I do not change the text, but merely look at this dilemma. I ask, when will God be rescued? from ungodly projections in order to be God. It continues a little while, I'll show you. Surely, God would be more creative than to um, rely on military conquest and even the, and the death penalty. as primal solutions, insisting that mortals carry out these solutions as a sign of obedience. And then I, it, this, I did this in the year that Robin was, was shot. I tremble when I read Deuteronomy 13. If there arises amongst you a dreamer of dreams and, uh, and he gives you a sign, you must not listen to that, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be on him to put him to death and the hand of the people after. So I wrote, I fear in this moment of time that the passage could have been interpreted to include the killer of Yitzhak Rabin. I, I struggled off for many years for 30 years ago, I wrote, um, holding on to the word ruach, I'll show you that word, that one word that I, I felt one word I could, I, could, I could tolerate almost and even love it. Uh, so I, that was the word ruach, um, not seeing the word smite. Uh, and then for years after that, I thought, okay, being Jewish was um, knowing the Kabbalah. I looked inward, I looked outward, and doing tikkun olam, 
with the earth layer, I came to realize the five books of Moses were indeed the five books of Moses. And then I let it be known that the liberation of God was my task so long overdue. So, so there I am highlighting, I'm highlighting it in pink. Now, I kept doing this highlighting until one day Robin Morgan, who is a co-founder of Ms., came over to me and she said, Helene, you think by highlighting, then you'll see what's left, and that will be good. And I said, and she said, it won't be. There's a patriarchal thread that runs through it everything. <coughs> I realize this is true. And that's when I did the book that will not close. I decided, okay, it's a sacred object. I'll see it as a sacred object. But it won't open and it won't close. Because I don't want to open it to this misogyny which I'll show you. Oh, this is my wailing wall. It's every page, not, not like the ones in the books, like the whole volume, but one page at a time. And, I call, and it's Hebrew on one side, English on the other. I showed that in Rowan College. Oh. God is skipping. Okay, I'm skipping. Uh, you know what? Okay, David, if you can go back with three. No. Okay, that's that's for my wailing wall. And then the next one, I started highlighting with a lens magnifier. Okay, and the next. Okay, I'll talk about this. This is called The Partition is um, Ready, but the Service Cannot Begin. And guess what the partition is made of? It's my from my art supply store, Eichler's in Borough Park. I bought these tzitzes, and that's the machitza. Oh, yeah. Okay. The reason the service can't begin is there may only be nine women. And that was the time that in my family they ran out to find any man <laughs> to be the tenth man so the service can't begin. Even if there were a hundred women. Okay. So I know it's funny. I think it's time. Meryl's laughing. We were crying, but now we're laughing. It's true. It is funny. <laughs> okay. This here is, I call this all rise. It's a bait in. So the bait in, unfortunately, women are forbidden to be judges. So on both sides, I have um, the flags are pink pillowcases. And it says, in God we trust, G dash D, pink dash. And I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the time where women can be judges because I'm prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Not only did I go into a clergy place that's <laughs> and order these in pink. Here's the back of them. But I felt, okay, we're ready. <laughs> Wait. Oh, you know, and the label 
is Kadosh because the piece is called All Rise and of course we go on our tiptoes three times for Naritzcha, the prayer. So that's the label. What's this? Oh no, I think this is... Okay, this was shown in the Jerusalem Biennale 2015, written behind my back, because I was betrayed. You will hear Habracha v'haklala, the blessing and the curse. And can you hear it? Okay. Oh, I'm glad that worked. So you see, it was written behind my back, literally. And now, this is a long time ago, the very first time that I, this, these are the three chapels at Kennedy Airport. And you see there's the image of the, of the tabernacles that was Torah. So what I did, oh, that inside, I made a, ch there was a chapel there, and I just painted the word Ruach over and over again, and the Reish, the Vav, and the Chet, and the Chet, it sort of looks like windows or doorways. I did that. And I also, there I am, half a century ago, painting those that were Ruach. And I made the doors, and the doors, I, um, I um, copied that same um, shape over and over. And you will see that it still remains with me. And how, at this year's, um, Jerusalem Biennale, 2017, I mean. Um, it was used, and I'll tell you how it was used now. Oh. Oh, that may be a slideshow. Oh, where is it? Well, when I, when I began my painting, oh, okay, when I, this is my painting. First, that I was looking for the Shekhinah, for the inner glow, because I was still in that mode. But then, I went to California, and I made, I wanted to make paintings that actually change. This refers to the body. Um, I must tell you, years ago there was a, an author who wrote a book called Eat, Pray, Love. <laughs> My words are body, earth, God. So this reminds me of the body. I poured oil, a skin formed, and then when lifting it up, it made its own sac the wet oil came down and would break. It was like birthing.
there, yeah, there I am. <sighs> oh God, yeah. <laughs> so I think yes, it will show it's you. All, it's all in shock until you see? inevitably it will burst. It just bursts. Sometimes it dribbles down slowly, and sometimes it just gushes out. And that's our psychological state. It's our physical state, our psychological state. It's how we feel now with everything that's happening. And it's, uh, that's, that's why I sort of like the metaphor. It got much more simplistic when it became a tarot talk. It, it, in fact, it got out in the world that way. I'm talking about my psychological states, my, yeah. our physical states, but I want to tell you where it really came from. It's a secret. How many of you know the prayer Asher Yatsar? There, that's the influence. Anyway, the sac was my metaphor. The liquid sac then became the pillowcase, which is like a container too. And then it became Earth sacks, stone sacks. This is in Israel. I united Arab and Jewish women to gather the stones in 1981 in the first intifada. And we talked about everything except politics. And it's the first image of peace that I have ever seen, frankly. I actually lured them to the uh, Museum of Haifa, saying that they will be on video, they will see video. And I felt, oh, well, if that's the way to get towards peace, that's all right. And uh, there they were. There are the sacks, the stone sacks. In Vadi Salib. That's where it was. And then the next thing was earth sacks. So we have liquid sacks, sand sacks, stone sacks, earth sacks. The earth sacks were pillowcases. I made an, air, an ambulance. And you know, in Borough Park, there was something called Hatsala. Did anybody ever hear of that? It, I would hear in my childhood, I would hear the sirens from Maimonides Hospital passing by swiftly. Ambulances, so I felt, I'll make an ambulance. And it got shown in creative time, art in the anchorage that was 10 years later, they asked for me to bring this because we took the ambulance and we went to 12 SAC bases, Strategic Air Command, SAC. I sort of made it simple. I mean, a little, a little too simple, but I said, our SAC is survive and continue. The bad SAC is strategic air command basis. So I could not go back after that because the earth would be contaminated. But at creative time urged me to do it anyway. And so was that another video? Oh, this is many years after all the pillowcases, women who wrote their dreams and nightmares about nuclear war. And it got shown in a show called Art of Engagement at the American University Museum. First, it got shown in the Berkeley Art Museum um, because uh, that was the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
I think it's really good for Jews to recognize and think about um, another Holocaust that happened during that same period. And that's going to be my focus of the next work. This is the voice of Meredith Monk, by the way. I call this Bridge of Knots, 1982 to 1995. It's the earth, putting the earth in their sacks. And they wrote their dreams on their sacks for they feared the sack of the military. That was on the Berkeley Art Museum. I thought it was time for women not to do their wash in the backyard, hanging up there, but rather in public places like the UN, like museums. There were Soviet pillowcases too there because I went to the Soviet Union to exchange pillowcases with women in Russia at the height of the Cold War. Again, we laughed. We said it's, we showed pictures of our babies and grandbabies and said, is this a communist baby? Is this a capitalist baby? <laughs> now, it's OK. I want you to see what happened when the Bridge of Knots was shown years later. What happened, this is continuous, because what happens is they're dropped like the dreams are falling. Oh, yes. Oh, the same one? Oh, it should go further up. I just want you to see how it falls. There they are. You're pushing it up? Okay. What else? What else is that? Oh. That's the American University Museum. <clears throat> Oh, 
I do like to see things dropping and falling. For the liberation of God, I don't know if I told you this, David, when I spoke to Ro Rolando Matalan, Rabbi, and I asked permission to do the first highlighting up on the very top of that dome. And I want to unfurl a scroll, but he thought that better not. But he allowed the uh, but he allowed everything else. I just imagine unfurling, airing out, and just dropping on the bima. <laughs> okay, those are the Japanese pillowcases. Also, what's next? Are there any questions so far while he's doing it? Oh, here. This is one Japanese hibakusha survivor of the A-bomb. And I'm just asking her to write her dream on her own pillowcase in her own home, in her own language. And then they, they did that. The pillowcase is collected from hibakusha's survivors. Well, uh, does somebody say in 1985, got shown 10 years later oh. on the West Coast at the University Art Museum. And just write something I could bring back. Oh, okay. Now, this is in Japan. And the two sacks, now they carry seeds. So they're seed sacks en route to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Everything in my work is... Um, there's some kind of miracle that happens. Like the sacks are sent on their river voyage, but they don't sink. I like to think that's a mo phase, you know? <laughs> some kind of signal. See, that's one of the sacks. It's joining the other sack. It's like love or something like that. So that's the work I'm going to be showing. I'm going to be showing the contents, what's in the sacks, the seeds and all that, whatever we, we carry. Um, now, where is Vanishing Pink? What else, what's the next one? Oh, this is my answer, my like my PS to the whole God Project, Nine Houses Without Women, because everybody, including Christians and Jews, reveres the Ten Commandments, right? And so I say, that there's something very wrong with the second commandment. And that's what I showed at the Jerusalem Biennale. I took pink, but it's vanishing pink. We all know this is bad. First of all, it's written as though it was in the name of God. Thou shalt ha not have any gods before me because I am a jealous God. Whoever wrote that? I visit the sins of the fathers unto the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, that's, in the, that's the second commandment. So I'm doing it in pink. But I'm saying the pink is vanishing 
because we don't know what to do about that. I mean, we have to talk about that. We have somebody has to come up with an idea of what to do. Vanishing pink. It's okay to highlight, but when it vanishes, where's the highlighting? Is this the last thing, David, I have? That I, if so, if this is the last, then we, I'm ready for questions or anything. If anybody has any comment or question. Oh, thanks to Leslie Tonkano of the Tonkano Gallery because Finally, finally, I have the gallery of my dreams. <laughs>
it wasn't God who wrote that. It wasn't, it was the Torah. Uh, it, I mean, it, it was not God. It was some author. I don't know who it was. Any, if any of you know more, tell me. <laughs> yes. I, I want to say that you're very diplomatic in the way you just handled that. Because in a book I did about 12 years ago, American Artist Jewish Images, which I did a chapter on you, and the operative verb was Moses hijacked the Bible. I said that? <laughs> I said that. Either you said it or was quoted, but I never agreed with that. But also okay. Jesus, so be it. And that everybody is invited to write their own Bible, which in the liberation of God you did. You wrote your own Bible. Yes, I remember that um, I wrote to Leah Rabin, actually. I just, I did not know her address, but after this happened to Rabin, and I just felt that I dedicated the liberation of God to, to Rabin because of that uh, terrible thing. So I wrote, Leah Rabin, Israel, and here's another miracle. It got there. <laughs> three, week, three weeks later, I get a letter from Leah Rabin, and she's going to be in Baltimore where this is going to be shown, and she'd like to see the liberation of God, and she's going to send a secret service for me to meet her. <laughs> so that was a very big adventure. So when I, when I brought her, you know the story, right? I brought her, she's very formidable. She scared me to death. She said, what do you mean, liberation of God? And I tried to explain, I explained that everybody's been liberated. Women's liberation, animal liberation, gay liberation, gray liberation. God had to be liberated. And then she actually listened, and then she said, oh, well, asiman la fang. That's a Hebrew expression, I suppose. It token clicked. Yes. <laughs> so, like you said, everybody has, has their own interpretation. Uh, yes. So, what sustains you in your connection to Judaism? What is my connection? You know, I am so nostalgic for everything. I am definitely um, schizophrenic because it is part of me at the same time. I cannot abide by this unapologetic sexism. So I don't know. I need help. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Any other comments or confessions? Yes, all the way in the back. Can you uh, tell me that, uh, your words? Um, your relationship to texts. To texts. Uh, or, uh, yeah. Like My relationship to the text? Well, I can't, like I said, I cannot be, I don't, I don't think it's the truth. I know there is a creator. I do know that. But, you know, I'm reminded of, again, with my notebooks, I dedicated it to Mrs. Rashi and Mrs. Maimonides, for surely they had something to say. <laughs> yes, I showed that first at the uh, Hadassah Brandeis 
uh, Institute and with Shulamith Reinhardt and she understood it and we did it together. Okay. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to say that people have mentioned Tikkun Olam and um, there's a joke about that. <laughs> um, not about you. Um, <laughs> this was uh, a Jewish person who went to Israel because of Tikkun Olam and she said, he said, how did you do? He said, how do you say Tikkun Olam in Hebrew? <laughs> <laughs> Discussion about that, but I actually like the Hillel adage better, which is more complicated than Tikkun which is an in on the Hebrew, right? Mm -hmm. It means I, if you don't take care of yourself, maybe particularly in this age of anti Semitic, we feel there's anti Semitism going in the Jewish world, but we shouldn't end there. And Shalom's work shows that because uh, she went to Japan, right? And she went all over the place talking to people about their pain. And she started right away, which was the last one of the books, Sorry About That, and, um, and has continued for all these years. So I think that you really live the Hillel adage from her day of old, which I think is very And I wonder who Mrs. Hillel was. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. I have to get on to my... Thanks, Anan. Uh, so um, lunch is uh, 